This is a video exploring the different models of the atom that scientists have used over the last 150 years or so. This is common content for GCSE chemistry and GCSE physics, so it could come up in either exam. In this video, we're going to try to understand why it is that the model of the atom has changed over time. We're going to talk about what the contributions were that were made by Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, Bohr and Chadwick. We'll describe the experimental work that Rutherford did, which led to the development of the nuclear model, and we'll explain how this experiment provided evidence that disproved the plum pudding model that came before it. Before we start this history lesson, let's talk quickly about why it is that the model of the atom has changed over time. The first thing you need to appreciate is that atoms are small, really small, far too small to see with even the very best microscope in the whole entire world. So it's not the case that we could just wait until someone came along with a better view of the atom to say, oh, that's what it looks like. The other thing you need to understand is how the scientific process works. So what scientists do is they look at the world around them and they look for things that haven't been explained yet. And then they develop a model or a theory which tries to explain that. And when we say a theory in science, we don't just mean some great idea that someone's had. We mean something that they can test with an experiment to see whether or not it's true. So over the years, scientists have come up with these theories and then they've come up with experiments to test them. And each time that they do one of these investigations and they find out something new that we didn't know before, that needs to be added into the model. The model gets updated and changed and more detailed. This is the model of the atom that you're already familiar with. And if you're not, then go watch the atomic structure video and then come back. This model allows us to explain all of the chemistry and physics we study up to GCSE. Even though we know quite a bit more about atoms now than we did when this model was developed, we don't need that extra information to understand any of the science that we're studying at this level, so we stick with a simpler model. So the atom is made up of three different subatomic particles. So sub means smaller than or lower than, so a subatomic particle is just something smaller than an atom. So we've got protons, electrons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus at the centre. Now, in this diagram, and pretty much every diagram you've ever seen, the nucleus is drawn quite large, but that's really just so that we can put the pluses on the protons and show that they're positive. In reality, the nucleus only makes up about one ten thousandth of the size of the atom. You should know about the relative masses and charges of these particles as well. So protons have a positive charge of plus one, electrons have a negative charge of minus one, so the ones show you that those charges are the same size, even though they're opposite polarity. And the neutron has no charge, it's neutral, so we show that with a zero. Then in terms of mass, the proton and neutron weigh about the same as each other, so we signify that with a one. And the mass of an electron is about 2,000 times smaller. But for GCSE, it's enough to just say that it's very small. Now we're going to look at some of the other models of the atom that came before the nuclear model that you use today in GCSE chemistry or physics. So we start with John Dalton, who was a British chemist and physicist and school teacher. Now, you wouldn't have realised it at the time, but when you first started studying chemistry in year seven or year eight, his is the model of the atom that you would have used. So where you're just drawing atoms as single circles and maybe you have a white circle for hydrogen and a black circle for carbon, that's the Dalton model. So his ideas were kind of similar to those of an ancient Greek philosopher called Democritus. Now, Democritus wasn't a scientist, but there were these ideas floating around that everything in the world could be made of some kind of raw ingredients called elements. And he kind of came up with this idea that there was a small indivisible particle, so a particle you couldn't break down any further. And he used the Greek word for indivisible, which is atomus. So Dalton decided to use that same word for his model and he compared the atoms to billiard balls. Now if you don't know what a billiard ball is it's basically a snooker ball so just imagine a hard sphere that you can't break down any further. And the Dalton model worked really well for quite a while but then later on other people did experiments and they made observations and so as a result the model had to be updated and changed. About 50 years after Dalton died the electron was discovered. Another scientist called J.J. Thompson discovered the electron and he measured its mass and showed that it was a lot, lot smaller than the mass of an atom. And so we stopped being able to think of atoms as these indivisible, fundamental particles and started to see that they needed to be broken down further. So he measured that the mass of an electron was about 2,000 times smaller and he also knew that electrons were negative. So he developed a new model called the plum pudding model. Now, if you've never heard of a plum pudding, it's a lot like a Christmas pudding. So imagine that sort of big spongy texture and then you've got individual sultanas studded into it, only they're plums. So in the plum pudding model, most of the atom was this large positively charged sphere and then the negative electrons were studded into it. 
you could be asked in your GCSE exam to compare the plum pudding model that JJ Thompson came up with with the nuclear model that we use today. So the two key differences are that the plum pudding model doesn't have a nucleus and that it doesn't have any shells. So instead of being around the outside, the electrons are embedded inside the atom. The next major breakthrough was made by a scientist from New Zealand by the name of Ernest Rutherford, working together with his students Geiger and Marston, who I always think should probably have got more credit. Rutherford came up with the scientific ideas, but it would have been Geiger and Marston who did all the legwork and collected all the data to prove them. Rutherford is the one example in the GCSE specification where you are supposed to know the details of the experiments that he did, so we'll go into more detail here. Rutherford, Geiger and Marston carried out what's known as the alpha scattering experiment. Alpha particles are made from two protons and two neutrons, so fundamentally they're exactly the same thing as a helium nucleus. Rutherford, Geiger and Marston took an alpha source, so that's a metal that gives off alpha particles when it does radioactive decay. And they fired those alpha particles at a very thin piece of gold foil. And what they found is that the vast majority of those alpha particles actually went straight through the gold foil. And they used this observation to reach the conclusion that most of the atom is actually empty space. Now, some of the particles were also deflected, either by small angles or directly backwards in what's called backscattering. They used this observation to reach the conclusion that the vast majority of the mass in the atom is concentrated right in the centre, into what we now call the nucleus. They also realised that the fact that this nucleus was repelling the positive alpha particle was evidence that the nucleus had a positive charge. Let's check that that made sense. Pause the video and write down an answer that explains why the plum pudding model was later replaced by the nuclear model. This would probably be a six mark question, but remember it's always okay to answer in bullet points as long as they're in a logical order. So firstly you should name the experiment, the alpha scattering experiment. Then you need to explain what that is. So scientists fired alpha particles at gold foil. Now we need the two observations and the conclusions based on that. So most particles passed straight through the gold foil and that showed that most of the atom was empty space. Some of them were deflected by large angles, and that was evidence that most of the mass was concentrated in a positive nucleus. Now finally, why did that lead them to throw out the plum pudding model? Well, it's because the plum pudding model had the mass and the charge spread throughout the atom. It wasn't mainly empty space, and it didn't have a nucleus. Rutherford's experiments led him to conclude that electrons orbited the outside of the atom, rather than being studded in the middle like in the plum pudding model. But they didn't tell him anything about where those electrons were. Niels Bohr calculated that the electrons needed to orbit the nucleus at fixed distances. Basically, he said that not all electrons were in the same shell. So this idea that we have up to two electrons in the first shell and then up to eight electrons in the second shell, that comes from him. So he did mathematical calculations to prove this, and then it turned out that his theoretical calculations agreed with experimental evidence that other people had done. So now we update the model of the atom to include shells. It's hard to agree on an exact date when protons were discovered because lots of different scientists were working on similar physics at the same time. They were trying to change one element into another by a process called bombardment, basically throwing particles at something to see what happened. But sometime around the end of the First World War, various scientists, including Rutherford, the same guy who did the alpha scattering experiment, started referring to hydrogen nuclei as protons. For the next few years, the scientific community basically worked on the basis that the nucleus was just made of protons. But then they started to find data that they couldn't explain using this model. So if you imagine that a proton has a mass of one and an electron has a mass that is so small that you just don't need to count it, then every element should have a relative atomic mass that is a whole number, one or two or three. But then there were some elements where when they were weighed, their mass wasn't a whole number, and there was no way of explaining this because you couldn't have half a proton. So then in 1932, James Chadwick discovered that there was also an uncharged particle that he called a neutron in the nucleus. And this was really important because it allowed us to explain why these masses weren't whole numbers. It was because there wasn't just one type of atom in there, there were multiple ones, and we call these different versions of the atom isotopes. So isotopes are different atoms of the same element, which have the same number of protons, which is how we now define an element, but different numbers of neutrons. So if you look at this example on the right, the top picture shows an isotope of lithium that has four neutrons, they're the green particles, whereas the bottom picture shows an isotope that has six neutrons. 
If you've got a sample of lithium that contains both of these types of atoms, then when you try and weigh it, you're going to end up with a relative atomic mass that isn't a whole number because it takes into account both of those different isotopes. Hopefully you're now clear on who these scientists were and what their contributions were and also why we changed the model of the atom in the first place. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos coming soon.